Welcome to SDC 18. Uh, my name is Jeff Hillen. I'm uh, one of the people that brought Redfish to the DMTF. I'm also the president and have chaired a whole bunch of stuff in it. Um, how many of y'all know anything about Redfish or Swordfish? All right, so we may go through a little bit, some of this pretty quick. Yeah, some of you I know, so. Um, just real quick, um, some of the stuff I'm showing, particularly at the end, the spec hasn't been fully released yet. So um, some of this information will change, um, probably not profoundly, although that's always possible, you never know. Um, but just, you know, uh, um, keep in mind that the latest information is always gonna be out on the DMTF website when it comes to Redfish. So when you look at uh, what we were trying to do when we first started Redfish was we had a bunch of uh, old silicon, really 8-bit micro stuff that was you know, running IPMI and real good at doing bitwise interfaces. But everybody out there in the industry was seeing the need for something a little more modern, a little more object-oriented. We tried Smash with uh, using sort of like SMIS. We used you know, WebM and um, um, WSMAN and all the whole SIM infrastructure model, and we did all these profiles and all this heavyweight stuff. And what it required was you had to build a whole bunch of layers. You had to build a protocol stack, and then you had to build something to eat the data model, and then you had to build something on the other side of the wire to provide all that information. It was a heavy lift, and one vendor did it. So IPMI was still king, and we, we kind of failed. And, and so we started looking around, and um, I, was, I was in a TC meeting when we were talking all this, and it kind of hit me that, you know, we're not, we're, we're making everybody do a heavy lift. What are all the cool kids doing, and why are they doing it? And well, they're, they're, they're glumming on to HTTP and HTTPS. Why? Well, it's secure. It's good enough for your bank account. Unlike IPMI, they invented their own security model, which is antiquated and wouldn't work and wouldn't scale anymore, and, and certainly wouldn't pass modern crypto. So, all right, let's pick what they're using, you know, and what is everybody else using? So you start looking at the programming languages and you fit a data model. It's like, well, let's find a schema language that fits that programming language, you know, that everybody's using. And um, so we picked something where you could do JSON representation because if you start looking at the, the curves, JSON was on its way up and all the SOAP based and XML and everything else was on its way down. So let's pick something modern that just plugs right into the infrastructure where libraries are already created and you don't really have to do a whole lot. Uh, Microsoft convinced us to do OData, OData v4. Um, you'll see that um, the vestiges of OData are becoming less and less important in Redfish. If, if you ever saw OData.context, that was really only used for programming languages. Uh, the Olingo library would grab the right part of the schema data model and go grab it. And it turns out we, we'd muted down so much of the OData stuff that nobody could even use the Olingo library and eat Redfish data anymore. So, gee, if you've got to have your own version of a standard library, let's just get rid of the rest. And so we're kind of going the way of Swagger now. And so you'll find uh, um, in, in, I guess it was released last week, Swagger definitions, because that whole, sorry, Open API, it's named now. Um, you'll find uh, uh, libraries out there that are all Open API based. So, Yes, we started with CSDL and JSON schema. JSON schema was kind of a funny one. Never really solid standard. Draft 4 became a, a de facto standard. A lot of people started using that. And so that's what we picked up. But um, we did need a schema language. And we knew SIM wasn't it. So we started with CSDL and JSON schema. And, and we're working our way over to um, YAML and you know, those, those open API versions. Because honestly, it's all about the payload. You should be able to read the bits on the wire and not have to go look it up in a schema language. And that was, some of the, that was something fairly new for the DMTF to go off and do. Versus, you know, all the, all the rest of the SIM stuff, you kind of had to know, oh, what's a value, value map? Because I'd get a two. Well, this was a value map. What did two mean? Well, two meant on. OK, great. Why don't we just put on in there? And why don't we make the property something readable, like power on? You know, so you don't have to figure out, oh, look, I'm in a computer system. The power is on. So, you know, trying to deliver that customer satisfaction of the, the poor guy in the IT trench who, you know, may or may not have gotten a two-year degree trying to figure out why his boss is on his neck because half the data center is down. So we're just trying to make that, that easier and yet stick to the modern tool chain. So if you wanted to build something programmable out of it, 
some programmable interface, some tool, upper level thing, you could do it and have a schema definition rich experience and you know, do whiz bang policy based kind of stuff. So try and hit two, two uh, audiences at once. Um, if you would save the questions to the end, because there, there's uh, the, the things being recorded. So um, for posterity, let's kind of keep this going. Um, we also created some new modeling tenants. And uh, uh, Joe White coined the phrases from Dell afterwards, after we'd already done them. It was like, look, if I have a, one of the pet peeves is an include of an include of an include of an include. So that if you have to go trace a definition down, you're running through four or five files. And we didn't want anybody to do that. It needs to be in the schema file that I look at. And so what we invented was something called inheritance by copy. Oh, if it's somewhere else, we're going to copy it and put it over here. Well, as a programmer, they're just like, gee, now that puts me in the maintenance mode of a standards writer, right? I've got to maintain those and keep them locked synced forever. OK, our pain, we'll do that. We'll make sure we do that. We'll put programming tools in place to make sure we do that. Um, just to make everybody else's life easier. And then the other one was polymorphism by union, which is a kind of, way, kind of a nice way of saying, you know, it's not really polymorphism at all. It's, it's um, one object, not an object that it inherits. It's a bunch of stuff. So like a computer system is of type physical or virtual or, or composed or, you know, some things may be in it. Uh, the fabric model is a good example of this. If you look at endpoint, well, is my endpoint a PCI thing? It's going to have a whole set of different things than if it's a InfiniBand object or a Gen Z object or whatever. So, you know, properties are going to be based, but let's just have one thing. Let's not create four or five or, you know, different ones of them. Let's just put them all in one object and only use the ones we care about. And so you'll see a lot of data patterns in Redfish that are the same. Um, so really what is Redfish? It's an industry standard defined management uh, for converged hybrid IT. Um, HTTPS and JSON format based on OData v4. It's schema backed but human readable. Usable for apps, GUI. In fact, you know, when we kind of did this, everybody makes web servers, right? In your BMC, you got a little web server engine and you got one object for your user interface and another one for IPMI. It's like, no, we want the GUI to use the Redfish objects. So let's make it JSON, because everybody's making their web GUIs out of JavaScript. Um, version 1 was focused on servers. The version submitted to the DMTF had a whole lot more in it. We thought out the data model pretty good. Um, and that's one of the reasons it's, it's broadly applicable, because of kind of everybody gets their own sandbox, because of the way we did it. Um, but we beat version 1 back to IPMI over LAN, but it's grown a whole lot since then. So, you know, we kind of tested out that, look, you can represent racks and blades and standalone equipment and, and all kinds of future equipment with it. We played with it a whole bunch before we took it in. Um, and then we knew we wanted to meet OCP's requirements because they were, uh, they were uh, uh, an increasing market share. So, And then expand that scope to the rest of IT over time, right? Additional features are coming out about every four months or so. Uh, we get them out as uh, kind of a train model. We're doing all our development in GitHub, so if a feature's not ready to go, we just don't put the pull into the source tree. Um, we're working with SNEA to cover more on Swordfish. You'll hear about that later. We're working with the Green Grid and ASHRAE. ASHRAE is the people that do air conditioning and heating in buildings. So they're looking at managing real power and cooling, crack units and all that with this. Um, we're working with the IETF and some other standards organiz organizations to cover some level of Ethernet switching. Um, that that one's becoming more and more uh, uh, complicated as things go along. We've got a pretty good uh, group of people. I won't concentrate on this too much. You know, it's pretty much if there's people building equipment at the device level or the system level or the integration level, um, that wasn't supposed to automate, but that's okay. Um, really, it's the other standards bodies that we're working with. One of the things that DMTF has is an alliance partner relationship with a whole bunch of companies. And people started coming out of the woodwork to work with Redfish and adapt it to their environment. And, and the reason is pretty straightforward, right? Look at it, industry standard servers are kind of a commodity thing, right? You got a processor and chip and all this and maybe a management processor, some kind of micro to turn the whole thing on in management and I squared C buses and all that kind of thing. And people are getting pretty creative about what you can do with that kind of thing, right? I can build a switch out of it, I can build a storage box out of it, I can build a this a box out of it, or an I IoT thing, industrial IoT thing, whatever. Well, what they don't do well is firmware management and power and cooling and, and what's my system, what's my memory, what's my load, what's my, you know, what they do do well is I do switches, I represent Ethernet, or I do storage as a service, network attached storage. 
So we kind of did all the rest of that infrastructure stuff and everybody else just creates their own sandbox. And that's why we've started working with so many different people. And, and that, and we'll show up to your meetings and help you out. So that's kind of new. It's uh, it had an interesting impact. So we've kind of expanded our scope slowly over time. You can see the whole list here, but pretty much what you read out of this is kind of a couple of things. Um, we've pretty much completed the server definition and we're down to the edges now where things kind of are, are more interesting. You know, role-based authorization and, and redoing the sensor model so I, industrial IoT can use it and, and keeping that aligned with the things that ASHRAE and the Green Grid are doing. Um, we've got works in progress out for Ethernet switching and, and that's working. We've got composability and I, I break composability up into three different kinds. There's little c, middle c, and big c compose, where the first compose we had was you've got to enumerate the individual resources you're going to use from your pool and say, put this together, whether it's a resource block or a computer system or stuff. We don't care, um, but you've got to be very purposeful. Middle c is kind of more of a swag of, ah, give me somewhere between two and four CPUs from this pool over here, and you know, I've got to have these things, I've got to have that thing. It's not the full bone, and that's what I call big C compose. It's kind of like what Swordfish did for storage. We haven't gotten there yet with the DMTF because we're not sure what that looks like when you start doing pools of servers or connections. Connections start to become real important when you start doing big C compose. We don't really have that modeled very well right now. Um, we've got a fabric model in there. We've got telemetry. We not only did a WIP, but that became final. So there's a whole telemetry model. Uh, SSE, the, the server sent eventing. So you can actually get a metric report sent to you when it gets generated now. Um, assemblies, erratas, um, query parameters are in there. Open API was the big one that we just got released, um, as well as job schedules, and we've uh, enhanced the messaging. So uh, work with SNE on that as well. And then, you know, we're, we're aligning the standards bodies, and you can uh, 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 re read the list right there. But um, it is becoming more, more and more uh, the central nexus of, of uh, manageability for hybrid IPTT infrastructure. So this is kind of the Redfish resource map, and I'm not going to go over it for very much. It's just we got some services off of the route, things like tasks and sessions and accounts and things that everybody needs, right? I've got to have give users access, and I've got to have a place to go get my schemas and you know, message registries and all this accounting and, and overhead kind of stuff. And then this is kind of what we started with was systems, chassis, and managers. And we wanted to separate the management ecosystem out from the computer system. And the, the, the system view is kind of the logical view, the data plane view of it. So you basically you know, got a data plane view of the world, a physical sheet metal view of the world, and the uh, management plane view of the world. And if you've got a switch-based view, or a fabric view, or a what a power, as it power and buildings, facilities kind of view, you just throw another collection off of the root. And that kind of tells you what to do. And, and uh, there's a composition service, and, and all of that is missing. But this is kind of the simplified model of what we've started with. IPMI also defined something called KCS, which was the host interface to the OS. KCS is this, actually, well, IPMI had three, what was a, um, uh, anyway, BT, block transfer engine, a third one that never got implemented, and KCS was the uh, most popular one. And it was a bitwise interface that was, you know, register mapped straight down, and they were trying to pass packets back and forth on it. Um, and it got to be real intractable when you did large things. So some of us had the idea about, oh, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, and finally put it into the standard of, what if you just had a NIC, right? And my BMC has a USB controller on it. All my virtual media is just firmware. My NIC, I can buy one off the shelf that's just firmware and make it show up because it's USB. Flash my firmware and I got a NIC that's showing up. Now what does that do to you? Well, my out-of-band interface, it's all HTTPS and that whole protocol stack, I've just plumbed it from the OS. So the same application that I'm running out-of-band management with, I can now run inside the system. Now you've got to solve the whole how does the kernel get to it and how does that special privilege work. And so we made a, a nonce that shows up in SMBIOS that the, the uh, system firmware can grab and get a special account. But other than that, all the code you write out of band works in band. Um, we also have something we're working on called profiles. 
like our predecessor, everything is optional. There's very little required because you don't know what kind of system you're building out of it. So make a profile that describes your system. Am I a front-end server? Am I a NAS box? Am I an enterprise class database server? You know, am I an OCP rack mount thing? Am I a blade? Am I a, you know? So really this is what is the common set of industry features expected for a certain class of product? We didn't want customers coming to us and saying, down to the property level, thou shalt support all this kind of thing. Instead, you'd really like them in their RFQs to just say, you know, support this profile. And so it's, it's as much about interoperability as it is about customers being able to just not go to vendors down to the property level. So uh, we do have an interoperability test suite that we built. There's a whole bunch of tools, and I'll, I'll give you pointers to those later. But uh, we do have the ability for interop tools to eat a profile and run a, a interop set based on that profile. So um, what Redfish did do, we didn't really tackle the storage stuff that Swordfish did, but we have the physical so server side of it. We started out with something called simple storage, which was really just a collection of disks, and it was nothing more than that. But we knew we had to do a better job of local storage, you know, that server class storage, storage light, whatever you want to call it. Um, so we developed a data model for that, and it exists of three objects. There's this thing called storage, because we couldn't call it controller. Because what if I'm doing HA storage, because that model in that storage box, you can have more than one controller, and that's how I've got, you know, my reliability is, is split across those two controllers. I could be doing software RAID, and so we just came up with a name, let's just call it storage. <laughs> and and uh, it's got controller objects in it. It's also got references to volumes and disks. And a disk is a physical media, exactly what you'd kind of expect. What's interesting about disk is where it can live. In the data model, you can either hang it off a chassis or you can hang it off of the controller, uh, the, the storage object. So really, do I have a JBOD while well, hanging off a chassis? Um, when we originally did this model, we were thinking of just doing slash redfish slash v1 slash disk. Just don't hang it off anything. Hang it on the, because we did a whole hypermedia thing. So it was like, hey, just hang it off of wherever you need to. None of the URIs were defined. Who cares? Well, when we went down the open API path, we had to define normative URIs for open API. So um, we, we nailed those two, two different things down for the derive. And then the volume, uh, volume, you know, that's your line, right? So that's the thing you create out of disks. Now, this same data model is completely analogous to how we did memory. Now, I don't have the memory model up here, but when you go poking through the memory, because there is storage class memory out there, uh, memory domain is storage. Memory is drive, and memory chunk is volume. Why memory chunk? Well, we couldn't call it LUN, we couldn't call it this, we couldn't call it that. Nobody knows what a memory chunk is. Perfect, that's what we'll call it. So a memory chunk is your block or your interleave set. Well, you couldn't call it interleave set. Not everything is interleaved, and not everything is blocked. So once again, we try and find a name that has no baggage associated with it. As far as how it's all mapped uh, in the, in the uh, data model, um, you'll see dashed lines on this and um, uh, solid lines. And the solid lines are what we call subordinate resources. And the other ones, I, we, we've never been consistent on the terminology. Sometimes it's related items. Sometimes it's, you know, anyway. But we are very strict on what a subordinate object is. And a subordinate object, particularly in open API, is you can tack it on to the URI you're at. And it gets funny in our definition because basically if it's a dotted line, you'll find it in a link section. The, the reference to it is in the link section of the object. And if it's a solid line, it's not. It's right off of the resource. Um, so every computer system you know, has a storage collection, right? We throw things in collections. So your storage object could have more than one storage thingy. I've got four controllers. Two of them are in one storage object because they're rated and I've got you know, two other that are separate because there's no HA between those controllers. They've got volumes off of them, and the volumes are pointing to disk drives, and then drives are hanging off a chassis. Really, in a class that you'll see in, in Swordfish, resources backing up a Swordfish re representation, you're probably going to find them on chassis more than you are hanging off of uh, 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 the storage object. How am I doing on time? Going through this a lot quicker than I thought. See, I did have room for all that detail. No, you don't. So the DMTF has been working on this thing called Redfish Device Enablement. 
How many people have heard of MCTP or PMCI Working Group or awesome, two, three, four, well, yeah. Sometimes. Um, so what happens to that signal when it comes inside the box? We're doing industry standard servers. We're trying to enable a community that's building solutions out of industry standard servers and industry standard components. What's wrong with specifying the manageability interface inside the box? So that Redfish, Redfish client is, RESTful client is sitting outside the server and he's sending a RESTful interface JSON, Redfish or Swordfish object straight down the Redfish management controller. And on the back plane, I've got an Ethernet set of objects, the ACD model or simple Ethernet. I've got a storage, simple storage or storage controller, you know, the storage object. What about any adapter that comes along? We've got a problem in the industry where, and, and, and customers hate it. My BIOS version has to match my BMC version, has to match my device version and my storage one and my, all of these things are being sent in bundles and then a customer has a problem and you send him a firmware update and he flashes it with Redfish and everything else breaks. So, or, or they need one thing or the other. And so all of this stuff, why is that? Because in order to understand how to communicate with that storage controller, that storage vendor will make something like a library that's compiled into the BMC, into the management controller. And so to take and represent all that storage, you are literally hard coded to a specific version of firmware. And if anything hiccups, anything changes, God forbid I do mixed vendor or, or, or multiple things from multiple vendors or worse, multiple things from the same vendor that don't use the same API, um, all of it kind of breaks. So we had the thought of, you know what? How long has the provider architecture been around in SIM? Over oh, a decade, getting close to two, well, 20 years, 20 years? Yeah, it's 20 years. 98. Yeah, 98, so okay. Um, and Moore's Law has caught up on those storage controllers and those things. You know, the BMC we started out with 20 years ago is far, far more under power than any of these devices out there. So if we can come up with a way of encapsulating that Redfish in a binary format, Redfish <laughs> payload in a binary format, and registering them when they come up as providers in the architecture, then I can break the interdependence between my versions of firmware. We're all speaking a common protocol on the different physical media types. That's all it should take. We've got I squared C plumbed to the boxes. We've got PCIe plumbed to the boxes. And that pretty much covers 95% of everything out there. There's other stuff coming along. And it turns out there's this thing called MCTP. Uh, management controller tunneling pro protocol that the PMCI work group did 15 years ago. What they were trying to do is the same thing, but at the server management level. They had this thing that they were doing called monitoring and control. I got a sensor out there. How do I get my data in a standard format down to the BMC so I can just show you temperature? And then they added to it. They added firmware update just recently, but they've been sitting on monitoring and control for quite a while. The NVMe guys looked at that with NVMe MI and mapped to MCTP their own way and did it totally different than everybody else in the industry. And you can already see it coming. Great, now I've got the same problem. In order for me to support a change in the NVMe MI firmware down on a set of devices, all of which could be different and support different versions, I gotta change my BMC code. So what we did was there's this thing called PM, PLDM, platform level data model, it's not a data model. Um, it's really yet another transport, if you think about it. Um, we did this thing called Redfish device enablement on top of it. And um, that's, that's really what it was all about, was a provider level architecture taking that JSON, turning it into binary, and getting it to be a provider architecture for the BMC, breaking the firmware independence between, uh, interdependence between the two. So what does it take to do that? Discovery, it turns out, when you power on the machine, that micro becomes something called an MCTP bus master. And 
It doesn't matter where it lives or what it is. Sometimes it's in a south bridge. Sometimes it's on its own chip. It doesn't matter. It goes out there and starts getting all these endpoint IDs and assigning them to every device it can find on I2C, on PCIe, on future things coming. We've, we're, uh, I can't talk about that one, but I can talk about Gen Z because we signed a firmware, a, a, a work register with them already. There's one up for vote on Thursday I can't talk about, but it's, an, it's a successor for one of those things I just mentioned. Um, anyway, uh, we've got MCTP mappings to all those low-level media types. You add a new media type, um, you just do an MCTP mapping for it. And as soon as you support that, um, you can do all kinds of stuff. So devices are discover discovered using MCTP, and then we go through and discover them using PLDM. Um, it negotiates parameters, right? When you think about a provider, what does it really take? Well, look at a redfish object. How do I fill it out? There's kind of three classes of objects inside that red, redfish thing. There's the stuff the BMC knows about, like the URI. The device is going to have no clue how any of that works. Um, my OData context or my OData ID. So you've got to figure out a way to when that thing comes back, because you want the BMC to not do any deep packet inspection. You want it just to regurgitate that packet. So I need some substitution variables, like the URI and the OData ID that the BMC just has in the table. And when that thing comes up, it just looks them up, shoves them in there. What's my schema language? What's my, you know, some of that stuff. The rest of it, you want the BMC to just be able to look things up in another way. So, so, and so we created this thing called a dictionary. It, we take the redfish schema language, schema definitions, and we alphabetize it and come up with the same order of sequence numbers so that all versions of the dictionary are backwards compatible. And... Um, the device carries its own dictionary. So the dictionary is going to take that property name and a nested property name and be able to just go through a recursive algorithm and substitute that property name for a sequence number. And so, okay, now I've got a consistent way of always encoding something in binary and always spitting it back. Well, what about enums? What about strings? What about numbers? What about nulls? Well, nulls are always null, so that's not a problem. Numbers are numbers. That's not a problem. That's easy in binary. Enums, translate them to a number. Use a dictionary. Same thing. Strings, uh, I can't do that. <laughs> I, I could maybe make a dictionary. Of, oh, no, 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 no. Too complicated. Just do strings or strings. And so um, that's kind of what's, what's, what's inside of them. So um, you know, we can go through and negotiate all this overhead kind of stuff, max chunk size, because MCTP doesn't have a very big packet size, so I'm going to be chunking. I'm going to do segmentation and reassembly. Nothing I can do about that. I squared C has got a very small packet format. Some of these redfish packets can be pretty darn big. So we need a way of doing all that stuff we've been doing. You know, you think about Ethernet and all the fabric and network management kind of stuff that you've done over the years. It's all been done before. We're just doing it inside the box. So what do I need to know? I need to get my dictionary, ret retrieve my dictionary, retrieve my schema, find all the instances you've got out there, storage and disks and all that kind of stuff, and, and come up with a number with them. And the MC has to know where they fit in the tree and be able to make a tree. Most of that is pushed down onto the device, except for top of tree. And it just says, hey, this is the top of tree. I'm of schema type storage. You might want to throw me in a storage collection and do the right thing. And, and that's kind of as complicated as it gets. So we did this thing called beige, and I guess I kind of already went into this. Basically, beige is the binary encoded JSON. It is inseparable from the dictionary. You can't do it without a dictionary, right? How, how do I take that sequence number, that number? Because it's a lookup table in a dictionary. So you can't do it without a dictionary. So that was why dictionaries are really the key. And those dictionaries, and we're going to be doing an open source tool that basically takes any schema and throws it into a dictionary. That way, all your OEM extensions can be in a dictionary. And, and uh, everything will work just fine. It includes how to nest objects. So it it's basically describes an algorithm for how to turn anything coming across in a Redfish-compatible JSON object into a binary form. And so when you see beige, think, OK, beige is an algorithm that uses a dictionary to turn JSON into binary. We get roughly a 10 to 1 in compression with it. And if you're trying to pull packets across I2C, um, there's some other cool stuff in it too, some optimizations I won't go over, but uh, um, there's, some, there's some cool stuff in there. Most importantly, even though we're publishing an open source dictionary generator, 
there's no value in everybody creating their own dictionary. So we're just going to go ahead and, and, and compress all the dictionaries and throw them out there just with the schemas. So folks can just go grab them. So the other thing you got to do is operations, right? Well, basically, we just kind of, if you look at HTTP, we came up with uh, uh, RDE operations that mirror all the HTTP operations. They've got different names for a reason. That's because of all this junk on the, uh, on the right that I talked about. How do I handle multiple outstanding operations? How do I handle tasks if something go takes a long time? What do I do about segmentation and reassembly? So there's all this state machine that you'll find in the spec on, OK, you transmitted a message. And the response, if it's short, the whole response comes back on the response. If it's long, there's all this get, get, and churning through. So, and it had to work both ways. So rather than go, you can always read that later and what those are. But um, for those you know, three or four people in the room, they're actually going to be implementing this. Um, dive into the spec. So how does it really all fit together, right? Before a client ever contacts the Redfish service, the management controller uses MCTP to enumerate all the devices on the bus. He's the MCTP bus master. There's all these mapping specs. He does it according to the I2C spec and the PCI spec and all that, so it's all medium dependent. Then, once he's got all the endpoint IDs mapped for everything in MCTP, he starts going using PLDM for the next phase of discovery. Okay. I know what MCTP types you supported. One of them was PLDM. Now I'm going to use PLDM discovery to say, what are the PLDM types you support? OK, I do monitoring and control. I do firmware update. And I do RDE. Awesome, you do RDE. So now I'm going to do the RDE discovery takes place. OK, get me your device registration. What are all your resources? What are all the actions? Give me your association. Give me your dictionary. Give me your schema language, max segment type, all this kind of stuff, you know, multiple outstanding operations, all this other stuff goes in there. There are detailed oriented versions of this on the DMTF website if you want to see in detail. Um, so finally, I'm all registered. I got all my URIs mapped. I'm showing them up in the data, mo data model. Somebody does a request on one of those and does a get. Uh, the, MCT, uh, the, the management controller gets that redfish, looks at the URI, and says, ah, oh, this particular object I don't have it. I'm not going to cache it. There's a controller out there that will respond to this request. So it uses, uh, takes the HTTP headers and encodes them and passes them down. It takes that JSON body and using the dictionaries and its substitution variables, encapsulates all that into binary encoded JSON, shoves that down. The MC initiates the operation to the device. There's all this uh, sequence number and junk goes on in that whole operation table, depending on the, you know, does it spawn a test and all that. So the device processes the request. Then when it's done, the MC takes the re response, does the exact same thing in reverse, takes that binary data using the dictionaries to re-span it back out into a JSON uh, request, and then puts the HTTP headers and all that back together and sends the response to the client. It sounds like a lot, but it's not nearly as bad as having all those firmware dependencies. And besides, it was doing all this anyway over the same buses using proprietary protocols and proprietary anything. What we've just created is a self-contained, self-describing data model on the adapter's firmware. I don't know what device this is as an MC. It can just show up. If I can figure out where to put it in the tree, that's all I need to know. I don't need to know about your properties. I don't need to know about your schema levels. I don't need to know anything. It's literally self-contained and self-subscribing. And a future thingy can come along. And as long as that MC knows to shove it in the tree, it can just show up and just work. So just some other information. RDE also handles tasks. Um, it specifies how events are handled. You know, eventing is, is something that was already defined in PLDM. So we had to figure out a way of mapping those PLDM events inside the Redfish data model, get it to show up. Um, uh, there's a state machine examples and tables. If you go out and look in the spec, and the, sp uh, the spec that's out there is fairly old, but the one that's coming out, hopefully really soon, we're, we're in the last days of balloting, hopefully. <laughs> uh, balloting the spec. There's examples on, one of the things we do as specs, specs is sometimes we just write normative stuff in there and don't write anything else. And we kind of felt with this spec that 
boy, somebody's going to get lost and do it wrong. So there's examples on how a dictionary gets formed. And sure, the algorithm is there and all the instructions are there, but there's also, gee, a program should make it look like this as I'm going through and, and organizing things and creating the dictionary. There's also examples on encoding and decoding a, 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 a packet from Redfish JSON to Beige and back. And so there's all this, you, you can go in there and look and it's you know literally, okay, here's the dictionary that we created from the previous encoding, and this is how you would use it to look it up and, and, and substitute all, all the variables. So there's really good state machine and examples and tables in the spec. Uh, binary format for the dictionary is specified, obviously, and then there, there are plenty of examples, and so they really did a, 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 a good job there. So in summary, and I'm, I'm way ahead, um, Redfish, along with DMTF Alliance Partners, is working to define interoperable storage, uh, interoperable software-defined hybrid IT management for servers, storage, networking, power, cooling, fabrics, anybody who'll talk to us in the industry. The coolest one, I thought, was the broadband forum. They do what's called user equipment. That's your cable modem. That's your set-top box. That's your... <laughs> it's like, wow, well... They're building a little thingy. It's got a CPU and memory, and they need to know if it overheats and, and congestion control and, and, and metrics and, you know. So, yeah, that one's scary. Um, so it's all, you know, composition for resource managers. We've got aggregation engines. That was thought into the model, right, is we know, sure, we're doing an MC, but what about an aggregator? You know, what, how, how do I do pools and pools of servers? Well, they're just members of collections. Um, and then we've got the plumbing, and we're plumbing the mechanisms inside the box as well. Um, we're doing more MCTP mappings anytime anything comes up. The latest thing we're working on at PLDM layer is security. Um, we spawned a security task force to look at attestation, firmware measurement, um, authorization inside the box. So there's a bunch of other people working at it right now, but none of them invented MCTP. There's things that we can do because we own the spec. We can go in the, and, and change bits at the core level that nobody else can do. And it's really the right way to do it. So, so one quick plug, um, tonight there's a boff, is it seven to eight or seven to nine? Um, we, have, we have the room from seven to nine. Okay, it may not last that long? The, the boff is, is really seven to eight. Um, it's about, just generally discussion about the about, uh, swordfish adoption questions from and we'll talk about it more in the next two sessions as well. But uh, uh, every, you know, any questions folks have about you know, how are things going with adoption, integration, what's going on in the in the uh, sortage ecosystem? And then tomorrow night's a hands-on workshop, two fifty in the afternoon. That's a it, weird it's time. All afternoon, uh, so it starts after the uh, after the lunch session is over. We'll be set up out in. The work out, out in the mezzanine area out here. Um, so for a, basically 250, um, it, it'll be set up, and then it'll also be running from from five to seven in the uh, in the uh, what's that session called, Donna? The uh, five, what's going on from five to seven? Uh, but uh, you can come reception. and see the reception. Thank you. Uh, but you can come out and look and. see uh, it's kind of halfway between vendor demos and a plug fest because stuff will actually be set up. You can come out and see some of what some of the various vendors actually have up and working in the sort free space. You can see tools, um, kind of a, a little bit of a current state of what's going on with uh, sort free implementations and ecosystems. And get hands on with the various stations. So, so, so come on out and get your hands dirty. And I'll repeat that twice more. Right. There's there's two more two more repeated <laughs> plugs for this. I think you'll be plugged. You'll four, four or five plugs for this one today. So this is just the first of many. Uh, one last slide. We've got a Redfish developer hub out there. Redfish.dmtf.org. Um, we're, we're adding more and more stuff out there. There's a, a schema index specs. We've got a program that now takes all those schemas and makes a human readable doc out of it called the Schema Guide, look for that. Man, I use that now instead of, you know, after spending three years of digging through CSDL, I'm glad we finally got that. 
Um, the registries, standard message registries, how to build BIOS registries. You know, we, we use the same term registries. It's not all these registries are the same. A BIOS registry is not equivalent to a message registry, which anyway, uh, unfortunate naming convention. Uh, there's a bunch of mockups out there where you can actually click down and look through the data. There's this little eye on here. It, when you go click through the different mockups, you click on that eye, you can find more about the resource. Uh, we've got simple rack-mounted servers, servers, bladed systems, OCP profile. There's, uh, I think, five or six of them out there now. Um, and then there's a whole educational community. Uh, there's the Redfish uh, user forum, um, which is that thing on the right. You can click to there, ask questions. We go through it in work group meetings every week and decide on the answers so that we're agreeing. With. Sometimes people respond right away. There's a swordfish section to that where the swordfish people are watching that. So uh, make sure you go take a look at that. White papers, presentations. Uh, the version of this slide deck that's got the gory details on RDE is published out there. And all the stuff they made me pull out because it was way more complicated than what I presented. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of YouTubes. There's a bunch more being added. Uh, we've got local storage out there. I think the ones coming up are sessions, advanced communication device, messaging one and two, and there's another one I can't remember. So we're, we're adding to those as quickly as we can. All right, any questions? Yes. So I have a question exclusively about this open API schema. It's a very good addition for DMTF to have. And we were trying to build documentation based on this, right? So the, the problem that we're facing is this when you use the swagger tools, the schema doesn't have the. Yeah, you know, we know. It, it doesn't render to HTML. If there are all kinds of problems like including, you know, we have this you know, notion of including uh, sub, sub resources, right? And it fails sometimes. Or it, another problem is any of time. Pope. There are some, you know, like keywords or compound structure that this Swagger tool doesn't understand. Right. So is there any other tools available that would be better? You so know, which, which version of the YAML files are you using? Uh, I guess the latest from the CMF to GitHub. Okay. Um, post questions on the user forum. When we publish those, we notice some problems with them right away. The guys at Texas Tech, we have a relationship with uh, um, um, the Cloud and Autonomic Computing Center at Texas Tech. And they've been going in there and running all the open API tools that they could and posting things, and we're fixing them as quick as we can. So this was our first foray into the YAML files, you know, and they've only been out. So it depends. If you got them more than five or six days ago, they might not uh, be the latest version. All right. The ones so that came, like yeah, yeah, yeah. The ones that came out after the 20th, I think or were ones that had some fixes in them. Now, is it gonna fix everything? I bet you there's bugs in them. It's all programmatically generated. And we will respond as quick as we can on fixing them because one of the things that DMTF has is a real lightweight policy for getting things out. We've got the work in progress stuff, which you know, in a week to 10 days, we can get something turned around. There's also a loophole in our standards body we call editorial. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's an editorial fix. Honestly, if it's something a tech writer or a non-schema person could fix, if it's a problem with format, if it's a problem with something like that, man, we'll voice vote it and get it out the door so quick your head will spin. Because we want you to have success with these files. We don't want you to have problems. You know? There's, if, there's one more question related to Okay. Because mockups are very useful, you know, even to realize what you want to you know, model, right? <laughs> and then mockups you can put in a, in a text file, which is, and then reuse it in your documentation. Yeah. But having open API schema, right? And writing the mockup, it's not that, that you can include any text file. You need to, you know, specifically write this example and trying to like initialize the schema with the parameters, right. which is troublesome. And do you have any BKMs how to work with the, let's say, the mockups and open API explicitly? You know, I again po post it to the forum. I've got some ideas. I don't know that everybody else agree with the same ideas. I will say one of the things we've done not very well because they don't fit up in the mockup explorer very well are things like establishing a session and those post kind of things. We don't really show post because that's all get data. And those we've discovered through the plug fest is where we've hit some of our interoperability holes and we're trying to figure out a way. Um, but we want people to beat on us to make a priority. That really does help. You know. Uh, him, him first if you don't mind. The uh, mentioned OData has a kind of support. One of the questions I have is around the OData query and um, how much of that needs to be supported or how much 
well needs to be supported is a funny expect. thing. How much of that do you expect? I know. You know, some of it doesn't make sense to me, and I, I can't give you an answer on that, but I'll tell you my preference, personal preference. I think expand is the bomb. I think expand is great. Because if you look at a collection and it's got 10 members in it, and I'm really trying to find the system that's powered off, I gotta go through each member of that collection and do it simultaneously. However, with, oh, I'm gonna get it wrong, expand and, and, and you gotta have, a, 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 what is it, tree, the, the um, depth part of it, level. Expand, level, equal. And then you gotta find that system, and I think it's dollar filter, it's not dollar select, but then you use dollar select to get just the property you want. We had our guy implement dollar select, and I think he said it took him five minutes, and it reduced his buffer size. So it actually turned out to be a benefit for the implementation to implement it. There was nothing to it. So um, it's the filter one that gets a little hard. You know, look for the property name equal off. So to me, those are the, those are the ones to do. There's two more optimizations we just put in. One's called only. If I have a collection and it's a trivial collection, and our definition of trivial collection means there's one member, by specifying only as a client, I don't get the collection, I get the member. Saves me from doing another round trip IO. I like that one. There's another one that you haven't seen yet called excerpt. You'll see it in the sensor model, which really is, is an interesting thing. Um, but I'm not gonna go into it because I've only got five more minutes and I want to get to his question. So those are my preference lists. Um, it really, I'm, I'd love to see clients start using them more. And your support for them is in the root, right? You, you indicate which, which things you support so the clients can know. You had a question? Yeah. So is there any plans to support JSON patch? No. Because that's scripting on the MC side. Remember me telling you about us starting with 8-bit micros? Well, we're now the state of the art of computing in about 1988 on those little devices. So they're still, you know, they don't have gigabytes of data, they got megabytes, right? Four, eight meg, you know? <laughs> they're maybe a 386 class, uh, they're not 486 class processors, you know? Um, they, don't, they don't have it. Um, honestly, what I want, never mind, I'm not going in there. To catch me afterwards at the buffer, I'll tell you what I'd like to see them do. But, but uh, uh, Jason Patch ends up being a real hard thing to implement in an MC because just the requirements, we looked at it and it was like, okay, even if I could do it right, the probability of me doing it wrong and creating yet another attack point makes it not worth it. And what you'd have to support is it only on specific objects in specific cases, couldn't do a general engine, you just don't have the, I mean, there's, there's, these objects are so big and so large that little MC is struggling to keep up as it is. That's why we had to make beige the way we did it. So the MC has no knowledge of what's in that package. It's just encoding it and decoding it and letting it fly through. I have a okay. About JSON, uh, uh, binary JSON format. How do you uh, handle the OEM extension? So, um, there's an OEM section clearly labeled OEM and then your pattern properties then says anything can be there. That OEM, like OHP, OEM Contoso, you'll see it in one of those examples, I think it's server one. You'll see OEM Contoso has an, uh, an at OData, um, uh, not ID, the, the schema definition, has its own schema definition with the URI to find that schema file. Yeah. Now technically you're supposed to put it in the OData service document and apply it on the link header if you, for the JSON version of all that but you've got to put that little piece of the OEM data, data header in there and then make sure it goes on the link header on its way out. So, uh, is that additionally to the uh, metadata for this uh, OEM session, you need to provide also a dictionary to convert it to binary. Yes, yep, and that's part of the, it's, I don't think it's explicitly called out because it doesn't need to be, but um, when you look at the new version of beige, there's dictionary type is in there and one of them is OEM, so. The OEM develop and publish a fixed dictionary and a fixed schema that correspond to anything that's in those extensions, the same way that we do the standard dictionary. DMTF has a... They can't, they can't change. They right. Can be a, a versioned and fixed. What, one quick thing, the DMTF has a republication portal. If you don't want to publish yours on your site, you can just give us the right to republish. There's a portal that says, look, I'm you're not giving you copyright, just the right to republish. We'll put it in our schema repo. 
One last question, then we got to go. Yes. That's what we started with. That's yeah. not where we ended up. But nowadays, we, we, we see requirements from customers that they, they, they ask whether they support redfish uh, in fish. But uh, uh, what my concern is about the, the scam. Uh, the small fish, the ISD, are building on the redfish. So uh, for the IP price, it, it, uh, which, which part should the BMC support? Redfish or swordfish? Uh, it's not an or. Yes. So, so I think you'll get a better picture of that in her presentation. So watch it, let her finish, and then and if you still have the question, let's ask it again. Because really there's no difference. You can shove swordfish in a redfish implementation, and you can't tell. Okay, so, uh, okay, so uh, I'm out of time. It's, it's her time to start. So ask that again, question again when she's done. All right. Thank you very much.